and I am happy to welcome you all in the fifth distinguished lecture uh, organized by the University of Kalani. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure and privilege to invite today's speaker of the lecture, Professor Shankar Chaliji, a renowned paleontologist who came all the way from the Texas Tech University, USA, to be with us uh, for the day. Professor Chatterjee mm -hmm. is Paul Whitfield Horn Professor of Geosciences and Curator of Paleontology at the Texas Tech University, USA. Uh, he will be telling us about the origin of life, which excites him much, and we are all eager to hear the talk. Now, I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Ratan Lal to kindly come on stage and please take your seat. I also request our Honorable Speaker, Professor Chong Chatterjee, to kindly come on stage. beginning of the program, I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor sir, to felicitate our Honorable Speaker by, by floral bouquet and the mimic. Very good afternoon to everybody at the University Fraternity. My colleagues, research scholars, on teaching staff, invited guests, and anybody from the press. Friends, it's a great honor and privilege for us to have Professor Shankar Chatterjee here. When we started the Distinguished Lecture Series, I was not fully hopeful, but I was determined. I was not hopeful whether we'd be in a position to carry it forward sometimes. But then all successes are born out of failures. And we succeeded finally in institutionalizing the Distinguished Lecture Series. I would only like to say that the formal introduction would certainly take place, but let me register here with my brief meeting with Professor Shankar Chatterjee that he is not among those scientists who write clouds without intimacy to winds. He is a reservoir of knowledge, experience, wisdom, and I'm sure the institution really feels inspired and honored by his presence. We are very proud of you, Professor Shankar Chatterjee. We will 
carry forward this distinguished lecture series by certainly getting many more distinguished scholars to this university and tell them about our efforts, about our perseverance, about our attitude, about our work. With these words, I certainly give my back to the head of department to continue the rest of the group. With the permission of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, I request Dr. Prashanjit Sharkel to present a uh, to present our university's profile in front of our speaker. So, Dr. Sharkel. <laughs> We started the in 1960. Uh, uh, we are around. Uh, we have a large print campus of about 500 acres, where 33 postgraduate departments are all having. Most of them are having their own buildings. They are spread around this beautiful campus of 500 acres. We are only 50 kilometers from the international airport, and uh, here in our campus, we have a lot of other facilities as well. We have banking with Medicoda e-services, one of the modern kiosks of Bank of India. We have our health center where all the university staff and faculties get some health benefits out of there. We have a regular university transport services where we have buses which ferries uh, faculties and students uh, to nearby destinations. For accommodation, we have a state-of-the-art guest house and we have gymnasium as well. We have ambulance and 24-hour internet services for our faculties. We have post office, canteen, student hostels, and staff quarters, all spread around this lush green campus of 500 acres. Uh, so far as the infrastructure is concerned, there are three central facilities. We have central libraries so where over one lakh books are there. We have uh, current newspapers. We subscribe nine of them. We have journals, including the back volumes, which are around 6,947 journals. There are theses which are archived in the library. We have the central instrument like laboratory as well as the central computer library, laboratory which actually monitors all the internet facilities and the computer services throughout the campus. Uh, we offer actually 30 MAMSC programs in the university through our faculties. There are three MTech programs which are running, two BTech programs and one MBA programs. We have two BA one MCA and one integrated MCA. We have introduced the choice based credit system since last year. And uh, there are 104 undergraduate colleges at the university through, uh, uh, we provide academic assistance to these undergraduate courses as well through our examination and syllabus systems. So these are the faculties that we have. We have actually four faculties where we have the faculty of arts and commerce, we have the faculty of education, we have faculty of uh, engineering technology and management. We have uh, the faculty of visual arts and of course we have the faculty of science. And we are soon introducing uh, Hindi and law as separate departments uh, in the following year. We are planning to do that. So these are our faculty strength. There are around 200 uh, teaching posts in the university catering to almost 2,000 students in 33 postgraduate departments. Uh, we have a, a great resource, uh, a very strong resource in terms of teachers because majority of the teachers, almost 90% of them have a doctorate as their highest degree. The composition of the teaching staff actually strikes a balance between entry level and senior incumbents. We have 32% of our uh, uh, teaching posts are uh, uh, professor or a professor designations. So we have 33% of them are professors as well. So uh, these are the kind of uh, teaching activities that are going on. As you can see that from 2009 onwards, if we compare the admission of students, there is a kind of steady uh, growth in the number of students that are admitted, particularly with respect to female students. We have excellent student evaluation about, about our teaching system as well. Perhaps the inflow is 
uh, sort of uh, stimulated by the students' evaluation. So considering five indicators that we have taken over here, we see that we get uh, very good ratings, almost 90% of the students have actually uh, sort of uh, rated the teaching as very good and good. Uh, we are trying, um, continuously trying to improve about the teaching system as well by continuously upgrading our curriculum. So apart from the regular teaching activities, we do have extension and outreach activities. Uh, particularly, we have four programs which are spearheading this outreach activities. One is adult and continuing education. We have social awareness programs as well. We have support facilities for underprivileged children and open and distant learning uh, programs that are running through the university as well. So, for example, uh, uh, this is a Department of Adult and Continuing Education which, can, uh, which conducts actually 33 short-term diploma courses per year. We have eight research centers as well, Rabindranath Study Center, Bioinformatics Infrastructure, just to narrow down the research agenda, and this center on environmental biotechnology. Center for Cultural Studies and Center for Women's Studies and Center for Bengali Diaspora. As you can see that our outreach uh, activities are also expanding throughout the year. We have a steady increase in the number of directorate and adult, uh, directorate of education and the distance education where the number of students is steadily increasing over time. And we are trying to soon introduce Center for Media and Good Governance uh, in the following year. So these are the research activities of the faculties. As you can see as well, again, there has been a steady increase from 2009 onwards to, uh, so considering there are 200 faculties on an average per annum, there are at least two publications per faculty per year in kind of a crew uh, sort of averages. So we have around uh, more than 1,000 publications in the last two years, around 2012-13. We have collaborative research programs as well. We are spreading with global and local partners with cutting edge research constituting technical university candidates from Germany, Uppsala University, Sweden. And among uh, the local partners, we have Indian Statistical Institute, Shahai Institute of Nuclear Physics, Kolkata, and Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, all are renowned institutes. So far as the research outreach is concerned, as you can see again, uh, the number of conferences in 2012-13 and 2013-14 shows that at least part department, if we consider 33 postgraduate departments, uh, uh, every year, part department, there has been at least one conference that has been organized. Even in terms of number of faculties who are disseminating their findings, we find that, uh, so if we consider 200 faculties, at least uh, two conferences are attended by each faculty uh, by presenting their research. So these are the research training that we provide. From 2009 onwards, again, there has been a steady upheaval of this research training programs in terms of number of students registered. Number of students who are awarded PhD sort of outcome of this training programs is also increasing. And we have crossed the 100 marks uh, since 2013-14. Uh, we have 118 students that have been awarded PhD. So we have tried to internationalize our programs as well. We have started under the honorable vice chancellor under the, his direction. We have started the memorandum of understanding for faculty and student exchange. We have already uh, signed our memorandum of understanding with Toronto based Noble Institute for Environmental. Yunnan Menzi University, China, and University of Lowe's. And we are moving steadily here after considering our uh, application with the Erasmus Mundus program as well. These are the distinguished lecture series that we have started that our Honorable Vice Chancellor has already mentioned that we have uh, Professor Rashish Dottu who have already done the, uh, the course lecture. Then we have uh, Professor Wilhelm Fabre, then K. Munayappa, Professor Roshim Dottu, and finally today we are. Uh, having Professor Shankar Chakravarti Chatterjee as our honourable guest. And with this, sir, we welcome you to our University of Kulani. Hope you will have a nice experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarkil. So now we have a, a introduction about our speaker, Professor Shankar <coughs> by Distinguished faculty members and guests. Indeed, I highly honored, I feel highly honored to introduce the world famous evolutionary biologist and renowned art scientist Professor Shankar Chatterjee. We are grateful to you, sir, for accepting our request to enlighten us about your vast academic experience. Rather, it is very difficult to present his enormous achievements within a short time. Just I am trying to present before you his valuable contributions in brief. Professor Chatterjee 
presently holds the position of Paul Whitfield Horn Professor of Geosciences and Museum Science, Curator of Paleontology and Director Antarctic Research Center, Museum of Texas Tech University, United States of America. He did his graduation as and post-graduation from Jadavpur University, Calcutta with outstanding academic achievements. He got his doctoral degree from Calcutta University and he did his postdoctoral and pre-doctoral works in Smithsonian Institute and London University respectively. He is, before joining uh, Texas State University actually, he was part of Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, University of California and George Washington University. He is visiting professor in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, and Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, Calcutta. He is associated with a number of professional organizations of international repute as well. He received numerous honors and awards for his exceptional contributions in academic world. He is elected fellows of Geological Society of America, American Association for the Advancement of Science, Best Scientist Award, and actually these are only few among them. It is our pride that he has been honored as Shera Bangali and Shera Shera by one of the leading publication houses of India. Professor Chatterjee published three books and more than 100 research papers, articles in prestigious scientific journals. His research work has been cited in books, scientific journals, popular magazines and newspapers such as Science, Nature, Discovery, New York Times, World Food, Encyclopedia Britannica, as well as several TV networks such as CBS, CNN and PBS. Professor Chatterjee's work has focused on the origin, evolution, functional anatomy and systematics of hearty beds both built between 252 and 65 million years ago, geologically known as Mesozoic Era, the age of dinosaurs. He has done important work on popularly known late Triassic reptiles in India, including phytosaurs. But he is best known for his work on vertebrates recovered in 1980 from the West Texas. This material includes the avian specimen, Proto-Avis, which pushes back the origin of birds to at least 75 million years. He takes an active interest in the fieldwork and research being conducted by him and his collaborators in United States, India, China, Antarctica and so on. Outcome of such interest has generated one of the best collection of the continental vertebrates in the world at the Museum of Texas State University. His interests also have focused on flying arbosaurs. He has worked on the biomechanics of flight in birds and pterosaurs and cranial kinesis in birds and has explored into oncogenetic and evolutionary issues relating to heterochrony in birds. Professor Chatterjee is involved with investigation into the neuroanatomy of arbosaurs to search evolution of arbosaur brain and intelligence. Larger scale interest involves plate tectonics and paleobiogeography. Professor Chatterjee is best known for discovering Shiba meteorite crater, which was created by a 25 mile wide meteorite that struck off the west coast of India near present day Mumbai. The meteorite created enough catastrophic force to destroy 70% of arts, plant, and animal communities including dinosaurs known as KT mass extinction at 65 million years ago. His latest research suggests a new symbiotic model for the origin of life by connecting theories on chemical evolution with evidences related to our planet's early geology, what he calls as the holy grail of science. Professor Chatterjee said, life began in four steps of increasing complexity cosmic, geological, chemical, and biological. Now we will begin the journey of life with Professor Chatterjee by his own voice 
and this is indeed a proud privilege for me to request Professor Chatterjee for his valuable deliberation. Please, sir. I want to thank you Dabuka, for such a nice introduction. And I'm really impressed meeting with your vice chairman, Dr. Amuru, and we have given you all kinds of talks, politics, and everything. And I must confess that we are meeting for people and interviews. It's such a beautiful campus, and, uh, and it's a great opportunity for me to talk about one of the most intriguing questions that you origin of life Now, just to give you some ideas, in our planet and the solar system formed roughly about 4.6 billion years ago. And in just in one million years time, you know, it was a still and that it was still violent in the beginning. And then, just after one million years, our planet was thinning we are very lucky. I tell you why we have this astronomical life. So, how could this happen? And mind you, the quest for the origins of life, maybe one of the oldest scientific theories, we still don't know the answer. We can only speculate. So, this is one of the speculations I'll be talking this afternoon, and I'm working on it. Next slide, please. Now, this is the genesis. If you read any religious literature, any philosophy, anywhere, all of it starts with a question of questions. And that is, how they die for the living on planet? And mind you, you'll find this thing. Everybody has a very good theory, big theory, and every generation writes its own creation name. But I was reading, you know, one of the Sloka or one of these poems of Rig Veda, this is so profound, so beautiful, it almost comes close to the modern theory of the origin of life. It says, I just, darkness was hidden by darkness in the beginning with no distinguished sign. All this was water. No, no sir. Thank you. 
planet, there was no oxygen. It was a reducing atmosphere. And they came out, they said, okay, it was methane, ammonia, hydrogen, water vapor. Okay? These are the important gases in our atmosphere. How did they know? Again, look at a vicious planet like Jupiter. And these are the common constituents. So it's a very good analogy. They said, okay, this is how you might start. Mind you, you're so bored. At that time, without any instruments or other things, they are dealing with your inner life. And what they suggested? They said, take these gases and maybe get a lightning. There may be some kind of you know, storms. And all these gases, they will combine together and they form a sort of thick soup. And that they call by the soup, which will be concentrated in the oceans. And the consistency would be just like it's a soup. And that became very popular by people forward. It's a good idea, but you know, there's no proof, nothing, so people forward. Then, you see, they came up in 1927. Then this young guy, his name was, you know, he was just a graduate student who was doing his PhD at the University of Chicago. He said, okay, let's try. You know, it's very difficult what Oparin said. So he took this, all these gases in you know, plus, and put some electric mixture. And bingo, what he found, look at here, almost he created 20 amino acids. So the red, you know, liquid, they are collecting. Mind you, the amino acids, these are the precursor for proteins. So suddenly it became very, very exciting. All over the world, there was sort of news that this young kid, he was able to create the IP test. And then it became famous like a rock star. Next slide, please. After Minas experience, it from all over the world. Thing, all the time you should thank 
that we, all of us, we are born with some astronomical luck. What was that luck? Then look at your position in relation to the sun. Okay? This is the Mercury, too close to the sun, and if we go there, we'll be born. Same with Venus. But is it a zone, you know, habitable zone? That means you can stay comfortably. And you see, Earth is right there. So among all these things, Venus is still too hot, Mars is too too cold. <coughs> But we are just right. So, I'm sure when you were young, you read this Goldilocks story. Not too hot, not too cold, but we just right. So this is why our planet is called Goldilocks planet. Okay. So to form life, you need this kind of environment, this kind of, you know, because you see our planet is large enough, so we could hold the atmosphere. You know, they are too small, Mercury and Venus. You know, Mercury, they don't have any. So we're not too hot, we're just right in time. And to do that, since we're in the right position, in our planet only today you see a fluid water. You need liquid water to create life. You see, our body contains 90% of water. So water is a medium. Without water, there would not be any life. Okay. Next slide. Now, almost for the last 50 years, the origin of life controversy was entirely handled by chemistry. They did all the experiments and all the things, but mind you, there are other scientists who could do it, but we are just standing on the fence. But this is such a complex issue, you know, from every discipline I have to call it. Because this is the oldest scientific person. Even Aristotle tried to, you know, explain. So what I said is that if we really take the big questions into sort of four different stages, maybe we can manage. So what are these stages? The very first is the cosmic stage, second is the geologic stage, third is the chemical stage, and fourth is the biological stage. Okay? And this is called real contingency. In other words, this gave us to be this state, this gave us to be this state, and this gave us to this state. And today, why new life is forming? Because all these you know, conditions are not present today. Okay? So, and through time, we can see there's only one denominator that is life has become more and more complex. Next slide, please. So, the very first cosmic state. Okay. What happens at the time? Mind you, in the very beginning, our planet was in a hospital. Day and night, our planet was bombarded by the Okay, Both asteroids and comets. It's not only our planets. All other planets in the solar system. Okay. So, there are two important contributions done by the one is the exogenous, that means from outside, okay, that we deliver. So what happens, I'll show you, these comets and asteroids, you know, meteorite is a general term. It contains both comets and asteroids. Comet means I see, asteroid means talking. Both comets and asteroids, they contain huge amount of building blocks of them. In fact, if you want to create life, you don't have to do it right here in the lab. It's already there in space. Okay? So what is done here, why that field started here? Because this is the endogenous. That means within the earth. Our mother earth probably was the best chef. So all this almost like you. You know, you go to the grocery, you buy all the you know, ingredients, then you put in a pot. To make your curry. So what our planet did, it has the right kind of form to have to hit it exactly where it is in the mechanisms. And basically life was synthesized in our planet. So there are two components. One, the intelligent state from space. The second, we have the right kind of environment where this could be synthesized. 
because these ingredients could not be produced in our DNA because it was very really down in the interstellar space, which is a freezing ice condition. But even today, if you find any meteorites, and if you study, you really find the ingredients of life. They are not just a piece of rock. And this is why we can say that meteorites, they are the poor people's in a space system. They contain huge amount of information. And all meteorites we form when our planet was formed. So if you want to get the very early history of our planet, which is almost gone, if it's missing, then you study it. Next slide, please. So these are we talked about. That means in the very beginning our planet was born by the day and night by this interlines. Okay? Next slide, please. So this is how. You can see our planet would almost look like the surface of the world. Okay, there are thousands of craters, and all the time, you know, these meteorites are coming. In fact, this is how moon was formed. About 4.2 million years ago, there's a big planet actually splash from our planet. So all the rocks there are hard to space, and this is how moon was created. So there is no terraformer, there is no surface. It was a more chaotic condition. And you cannot have life in this high depth. So this particular period is called media period. Almost from 4.6 to 4 billion years, there is no life, but extremely hot, and heavy and little is heavy. Okay? Next slide, please. So now look at moon. Moon is a dead piece of rock. What you see here? Only you will see thousands and thousands of craters. Look at Mercury. Same thing. It's a dead piece of rock. Again, the only geologic figures you see in thousands of craters. These craters were formed about four million years ago. And exactly our planet would look like this. But why do you not see any craters? Because our planet is unique. As I said, we have some unique features which help to God for the planet. One of them is called hectares. What does it mean? That our outer crust, they all the time reset. The moon, you can actually measure about five centimeters per year. If you go to the top of the Mount Everest, there's a very good chance you may get a fossil of fish. What does it mean? Did fish live on the top of the mountain? No. One time, this was the floor of the ocean. Because it swims on the So all the time, there's a recycling of our crust, and that takes the you know, make our planet so dynamic. You don't see in any other planets, not on Mercury, not on Moon, not on Mars, not on Venus, the gaseous planets. You know, it's, it doesn't matter. So that should be the very first day. If you want to see how our planet would look like, it would be exactly the surface of the Moon or Mercury. Okay? It is really heavily catered. Next slide. Now these particular meteorites are time, till time and again. It's a very famous murky sun which fell in Australia. But whenever the comet passes, scientists really determine the composition. And what they have found, and uh, that all the ingredients, okay, there's the water, there's you know, all these nucleotides, all the amino acids you need to form like everything. All the building blocks of life have been needed. Next slide, please. You may know about this very mission which is just right now going on called Rossiter mission. Okay? This Finny lander, which actually landed, so this is a piece of dirty ice. An European mission landed on this comet. And what they found, it's a very interesting thing. For a long time, people thought, you know, I mean, our planet, think about it, it's a water planet. And people always thought the source of the water, you know, is mainly from comets. But when they analyze, so this is really I see, when they analyze the composition of this comet, they found, you know, if you really can calculate the ratio of the heavy hydrogen and dark air to normal hydrogen, about 150. 
part spread me here. That is here, this is quite different. But in asteroid, it is the same coverage. So at least these loss information for one time until I clearly prove that the water did not come from comets, but it came actually from these asteroids. Okay? So this is a big, big discovery. Next slide, please. So just beginning, as I said, my history meteorite is one of the most famous and has been studied by thousands of scientists. Okay? It fell in Australia, Western Australia, on 20th September 1969. This is the Murchison Missing One. And think about when we analyze these things, they found the amino acids, which you need to make proteins. They found all the nuclear type bases, if you want to make you know, DNA and other nuclear bases. And also the lipid membranes, if you want to make the membranes, the cell membranes, the actual component is this. It all came from the what organic thing? Because these are not light. If you just bring some you know, ingredients, that doesn't mean that you have to prepare the dish. You have cooking. So the cooking was done in the biggest of years. But the beauty of our planet is this is why the cooking was done. Next question. So our planet was to supply. The question was, why did it start? And again, the scientists did not. And they did not. There are many theories. The most popular is called hydrothermal vent system. Okay. And I suggested that these hydrothermal vent systems, they are still present today, except we cannot think of this. Okay. But today, if you go to the any ocean, like Atlantic, you can have a submersible, go down, and at the center of the Atlantic, you see it almost like a mountain, two, three miles high. The lava is coming out. And if you look down, you will be surprised. There's a oasis of life. Because for a long time, we thought life can only represent where there is a sunlight. But these life are supported not by sunlight, but the heat of the land. And you find all kinds of life. In what the way it's even fish, and but the but the base of the food chain is called carbon piles or the heat that is that. And maybe this is the oldest ecosystem which stayed present today. Okay? So you see the business, you know, that thing, it needs a dark. Because you see two, three miles deep in the ocean floor, it is very dark. And it is very hot, sometimes the temperature may be. Four hundred in the same. Next slide, please. And just to give us a timeline, okay? We know our planet is 4.6 billion years ago. We know by that time, 3.8 billion years ago, the very fast light form. And we know that this time there could not be no light because it was really sort of very hot, hellish. So it formed very quickly. Once our planet was full of oceans, the light started taking. Next slide, please. So, you see, about 4 billion years ago, in the beginning of our time, we had the ocean for 4 <coughs> The question is, how do you know? This is one of the main for zircon. And zircon is very common in these rocks, in the arcade rocks. And zircon cannot be found in the water. So, the presence of zircon in this tells us that by that time, the ocean was formed, our atmosphere is full of water vapor. And the rain started falling, so it's almost like today's, you know, condition. Okay, warm, equilibrium. And so, in this condition, for the life form, ocean is. Do you think life can be formed in this vast ocean? We need a sequestered this small basin, because you see, the ingredients have to be, you know, concentrated. And this is why, whenever you cook, you don't take a big pot, you take a small pot, so you can concentrate. Okay, so we have to come up with something which should be present at a time, but it should be much smaller than the ocean. So what was that? Next slide. Again, we can learn from our neighbor. Look at moon. The only feature you see is the ancient craters. Mind you, after that cratering episode, 
food died out. There's no water, no air, so it's just no atmosphere, and there's no particular So it faithfully recorded the food because they are sold. Exactly all the like that. If we go back in time, when that might have been started. And this crater, if you look some of these craters, it could be thousand miles radius at their diameter. Big. And always in this crater, at the center, you will find a sort of peak or center peak just like the mountain. Sometimes the lava comes out from this peak. Because the impact is so strong that these are all filled up by lava. And again, you can see the center of the And these are actually lava filled lake. This is why it is called lunar maria. Lunar maria means lava filled lake. Next slide, please. In fact, this is so fascinating. You know that NASA is exploring life on Mars. And the site they choose, you see this material robot, it is actually exploring. They are actually exploring this lake to that. Again, you see this lady, center peak, and this is why, you know, if you take all this in, this is how we get the kind of look that gets picked up by water. Okay. So, this is ideal between, this is the condition where life might have been formed. Not in the big ocean, but, I mean, not in this, you know, hydrothermal great big ocean, but this sort of crater, which were abundant at the time, and in many cases, at the center, you'll find this, you know, uh, mountain, which is erupted up. Next slide, please. So these are the typical hydrothermal things. If you go to any ocean, you'll see the lava is coming out, and you, you think, mind you, sunlight kind of penetrates, because it may be too thin, it's dark, hot. But if you look very carefully, you'll see all kinds of life there. It's an entirely new kind of thing. In before seventies, people never thought that life could actually, you know, um, uh, sustain at this in an after the time. Okay. So what is happening? We are emitting lots of so the water is percolating through it, and it is mixing with the magma, and then you see the methane, hydrogen sulfur, carbon dioxide, iron, you know, is very active. So think about it. you will bring the ingredients came from space, from an asteroid and comet. And you are also adding, you know, which is available there. And you are mixing and matching. Okay, next slide, please. Another very popular theory is that, you know, it's, it's the same kind of thing, but these are called, you know, lost city or alkaline number thing. Okay, next slide, please. But I really believe that this is a much better candidate to take this candidate because they were there. And also, it is not too hot. The temperature may be about 60 degrees. Because uh, in hydrothermal bed temperature is 400 degrees, many of the water in the pumps can be now. Next slide, please. This is a very fascinating thing. Now, these bacteria still present today. If you go to any hot springs or if you go to this hydrothermal bed, these are called thermophiles. This is the oldest kind of life still present today. Thermophile means heat level. And from molecular phylogeny, they were found. This is the most primitive kind. So these bacteria, they can only form at a very high temperature, you know, pressure. For example, in, uh, in America, Eurasia National Park, you know, this is beautiful, beautiful color. These are actually full of bacteria. But the temperature may be, you know, 60, 70, 100 degrees. So these are the oldest form of life still today. We form at this sort of, you know, very dark or in one way. And there is some signature. You know, there is signature, certain iron, rocks, by which you can deposture the environment of this pen. Next step is. So these oldest crater type structure have still visited today. One is in Greenland, one is in South Africa, and one is in Australia. They are the oldest one. 3.5 to 4 billion years old. And surprisingly, the oldest fossils have been found from the sea areas, and they are very similar to thermophiles. And 
questions and then and only then. So this is what I'm calling it RNA cookie work. Next slide. So you see again this um, controversy, some people, you know, there are two proteins, some are low RNA, but I really believe that it's sort of RNA protein, you know, you went there all the time together. Next slide, please. You can see the next slide, please. Now, you know, again, I want to emphasize that how much information is there in the nuclear Okay, it's the same part of the nuclear This is my very good friend, David Gimmer, he's one of the authorities of the Oxford. All that we did in work with. So what he did, it's a very elegant experience. He crushed some of the Marchison material and he put it in water. And guess what? Was it, no, he didn't do anything. He was able to create exactly the cell, cell matrix, same lipid matrix, which was there here. Then he put some ingredients. The rainfall and when they divide, it is there. Next slide. So same method is already there from space. You don't have to create. So I did it with David Dimmer that that was probably the very first thing which was there. And so this is the environment, you see. These are the crater, this is how it looked at. This part is just like a bend. And all these gases are there. So some came from space. Others right here, and they're sort of churning, and you know, they're making sort of big, big soup. And mind you, this is the most important area. The sediments are the floor of the crater. This is where all the silk organics, their polymerase, they're turning into more complex okay? These are the mineral substrate, and they have this magic power. They are the catalyst. It also form a special component, this is our before marriage. Next slide, please. So again, just to give you very quickly, this is how a sort of cell membrane looks like, but you know, so single layer, we eventually they form this two layer structure. And again, David Dimmer did a very good experiment. What he found at the surface is the single layer of this cell, and as you go down, this is this double layer. Next slide, please. So again, this is sort of you see the same layer, and you know, one side sort of, you know, large water, another deep this water. And this is how it protects the very important. So this is why you, you know, DNA, RNA, what it is. Next slide, please. One of the mystery of life, you know, this I want to emphasize. That all, you know, we need only 20 amino acids to make proteins. And if all the amino acids, and all the sugars in our DNA and DNA are right. In nature, in laboratory, if you produce, like Miller did it, you will get 50-50. 50% of the left active, 50% of the left active. But why every living thing has its tendencies that is always amino acid? This is the mystery of this. This is our person. In fact, one of the things NASA will do is they find a life on Mars. Very fast thing they'll do, they'll check the handedness of an amino acids and sugar. And do they look like life on Mars? And do they look safe? If they find the life in the amino acids there, and they find the sugar is there, then they can say that life on Mars life on Mars, they took a different uh, they have a different, two different origins. But if they find the same thing, then it's a very inconsistent. Maybe, you know, there's a common one. So this is a very important thing, and I want to stress you that what a magic, okay? So these are called chiral molecules, that means handedness. No, for example, you may not know, but although they have the same composition, they have actually different properties. Now, if you have the headache, you think hydrochloric. You know, like tiling or all this kind of thing. And in the pharmaceutical company, when they produce, it will be in a 50% left handed, 50% right handed. But they know that left handed hydrocopulin has much more potential than the right handed. So they separate. Next slide, please. Now, this is what I call this the magic 
all the time they do these things. Okay? But in nature, mother attacked you from the very beginning they selected. Why? So these guys are going to be very fast. They were related to their as and so on. And they died and then sugar and sucrose. And then they joined together. What is polymerase issue? Look at this. Here we have this quark. But how these quarks are made? We just put bricks together. So if you take this simple monomer and join together, it creates polymer. So we take monomer like amino acids, it creates proteins. We take what the nickname of dyes, join together, it creates polymer. So this polymer took place many at the fruit. The minerals had a sort of huge power. They are beautiful characters. Next slide. So just to give you some idea, idea it is so beautiful. For example, look at when they have turned the right They look similar. Same kind of five fingers we have found where this uh, thing is. But if you wipe these gloves, you know, right on the gloves to the left turn, it will not be. Exactly. You see these two molecules, they exactly look similar, but they have integrity in the problems. But there's certain minerals, like cancer, if you put it, they can separate. They turn into amino acids, they will be concentrated in one, one surface, they write that they will be on the other surface. So most striking is minerals, they need this catalyst, they separate these antigens. Before, you know, complex is formed. Next slide, please. So, you have all the means and ideas you believe that RNA produces really important. All right, please look at that. Next slide, please. So, this is again. So, this is why the sediments of the spark. Some of them, they want to be You almost saw it, or click. But it is a time. They have so much important medical thing. If you look clear under an electron microscope, it's a very complex space. And they have some empty spaces. So claiming us act as a step. If you want to take a big thing, okay, and if you just put some chemicals inside and take this clear out, you will get a huge Similarly, these minerals are bilateral food stores. They have the same kind of thing, you know, space. And this is how amino acids can be the joint, and they'll be joined together, linked together, and that. So these create these minerals really with beautiful things called polymerase. It's like this. So this is how protein looks like. Okay, these are all the same kind of amino acids. They're joined together to make this protein. And similarly, these are the same thing. So this is the next stage that monomarks the link together to pop polymers in many cases, water is experiment and this is how you can Next slide please. So basically this is how my technology is. So they're random. Okay, there is no direction, nothing. So this think about so we are really it live. And so this empty either this membrane. They are, they are coming to the surface and they are enclosing maybe you know, here, say RNA, maybe here, some of this, you know, this is protein. And you make sure they are you know, fused together. And then, if you put two people in one group and put some food, eventually they will come. Exactly this very simple molecule, they start to form. But uh, before I go to that thing, in my this was one of my very good friends, and one of the top scientists, uh, she died in a couple of years now. But in biology, my dear heart, you know, are wonderful to be got sick by some sex. Basically, what she suggested that you can use it, because it's safe, it doesn't need to be. Really, you can use it. The most important, you know, basic form of life. How it is created? Not by dynamic computer, rather cooperation. She thinks two or two that we are living together, we are helping each other, and fused together, and create this important part. This is called synthesis. So you help me under. And how do you look at any interface? If you look at this particular animal that you will find this mind of and the 
So basically, you see, this is just a set of, you know, possible facts. You do not know. These are all these speculations. Okay? There are thousands of you know, speculations that have been proposed for the Osmond of Time. As I said, this is the most complicated. Maybe only have this whole thing. But you see, we don't know how to do it. Because for all these things, for 50 years, it was the domain of speculations. Uh, well, let it allow uh, that part to do it. Okay. So I always think the different diversifying groups that are coming out from the single cell, as we say, from the simple to the cell or one, uh, how the nucleotides are not changing. Only 20 amino acids remaining the same. The same pentose, sugar, and deoxyribose and ribose sugar. These are not changing. And if RNA has come, if RNA. If RNA has come and if RNA is doing the vital function of the nucleic acid as well as the protein, as ribozyme, so what is the necessity of DNA? So these are uh, so much of uh, difficulties to understand how the first cell and how whether it is symbiosis or it is a Darwinian model or not, it is very difficult. Another thing, uh, the previous world didn't have any oxygen. Now, if there is a free oxygen available, it will definitely oxidize. I think that can be better. Yeah, there is no oxygen. You know, oxygen came about two point five. Then, uh, yeah, then if the oxygen came, and if they are in the free state, if they oxidize, the entire biomolecule will destroy. So, there is some... Nature is... I, I believe in that thing. 
that what nature can do, science can't do. We can't, not, not science can do, we can't do, or it's of course for billions and billions of years of research. Okay, you have too many questions, I'll answer I don't three. have too many questions, just my... I'll, I'll answer a few things. For 4 billion years to 2.5 billion years ago, it was a very boring evolution. Why? Because when the cell splits, there is really not much combination. There is no sex. You see, people don't realize that until and unless sex evolves, that means, you know, you get this genetic exchange between two cells, then you don't get variation. Until and unless you get variation, the natural selection cannot operate. So for this whole 4 billion years to 2.5 billion years ago, it was just the world of bacteria, not much change. Can you imagine why the thermophiles, if it is the oldest one, still present today? But once the eukaryote came into the picture, suddenly there is a you know, burst of life. Because that is a mechanism for variation. You see, until and unless we have a genetic variation, natural selection cannot occur. How is the eukaryote more. I showed you that the marble is thick, and then, then I will tell you the whole evolution of life. You know, we are really concentrating on the very fast. But from you can, if, if you look at the fossil form, suddenly you see the variation in the fossil form. Any other questions? If not, I will stop. I need one from the students. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, wonderful lecture. And uh, actually, I ask you a uh, few questions due to my ignorance. Uh, you have uh, proposed a uh, uh, four theory for the origin of life. One is uh, cosmological theory, that is primordial soup theories. And second is uh, geological theories. Third is biochemical theories. And fourth one is biological theories. Uh, as for uh, geological theories, hydrothermal vent is the source of the uh, site where life has originated, might but have. might have originated. But uh, uh, we know that ocean has originated last three billion of years ago, mm -hmm. and there are some evidences that uh, primitive biomolecules, say for example, as for biochemical theory, primitive biomolecules, I mean coding molecules, purine, pyrimidines and some amino acids and some biocatalyst enzymes have been found in on some clay particles before the evolution of the, before the origin of the oceans. So, as per geological views, hydrothermal vent is the origin of the life, but there are some other evidences. But I support one of the theories that the presence of stromatolites which has been discovered, the fossil of Archaebacteria, you have mentioned that halophytes. Archaebacteria mats has been uh, discovered in the South Bay in the Western Australia. That proves that life might be originated from the oceans, but before that, uh, primitive biomolecules have been originated from the case of these particles, I mean, before the origin of the oceans. Uh, could you explain, I mean, what is the most Plausible, acceptable theory for the origin of life. Okay, you see the half of the molecules you are talking about, they came from space. So just look at any asteroid. They have all been isolated. You don't have to see it here. Second is you are talking about stomatolites that really appeared about 2.5 billion years ago. These are the cyanobacteria. When they change their strategy, they, they are not taking energy from the lava. Instead, they are taking energy. As soon as the bacteria came to the what surface, is from fossils you cannot tell, tell whether it's archaeobacteria or, you know, uh, yeah, just you can, you know, from morphology you cannot say. Living, yes, because, you know, these are really done by phylogeny, by molecular phylogeny. But the question is that solar, you know, they really harness solar energy much, much later time. So the very first kind of energy, which is not very efficient, that is, from the heat, from the lava. Then the same battery, in fact, there is a very nice study how the thermophiles came to the surface and then they realized that, look, we don't have to depend on this, you know, heat. And in fact, today we'll see the only found along the deeper part of the oceans which is really hostile. But all the life you see today is a really powered by sun. Solar light is much more efficient, simple, Clean, but in the beginning, it was much, it was entirely different. 
Any other questions? I really want something from the students. If you have. I have a question that uh, you said that uh, moon originated uh, 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 at uh, the time moon originated it had the contents which could sustain life you know you showed that it had water or something like that uh, at the first time when it originated but suddenly it became a dead rock and I think it lies within the zone where life can sustain you know uh, it's uh, pretty much close to the earth so it's uh, lying in the Goldilocks zone. So why did uh, moon suddenly become the tip drop and why life uh, didn't originate in the moon? Very good questions. Now, not only moon, look at Mercury, okay, look at Venus. What happened, two things, you know, we do not believe the role of spray tectonics, okay? And you have to have water in liquid forms. You know, this is the simple criteria. Until and unless you have a water in liquid form. If there is an ice, there should not be any life. For example, Titan and Europa, you know, these are actually NASA zeroing on whether life could be there. The only problem is both are icy. It's almost like Antarctica. But yes, they are still thinking below the ice there may be sort of, you know, like in Antarctica we have seen, you know, these are frozen lake. If we just make a hole, water is there below. You know. Okay? So you need liquid water. You know, this is a very minimal requirement. Okay? And the moon has first, you know, it lacks liquid water. It doesn't have any atmosphere. Here, you know, I mean, there is always a recycling. There is a changing of climate. Okay? We have so many ingredients and all these things. And most of it is in plate tectonics. You know, the, the role of plate tectonics, but we cannot visualize. Sure For example, do you know we are talking about global warming? But most of this CO2 is really recycled by the plate tectonics. So it is really sort of life giver. And we are very lucky that we have this you know, main engine inside, you know, built in our mind. And that is not so, it's a luxury. So you see, we really started with several astronomical lots. We are in the right positions. This is why we have this you know, water in liquid form. We have this, you know, we are able to hold the atmosphere. Because they are too small, you know, moon there is the atmosphere. It is too small. Any other questions? From the students. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm getting a hand of story. Okay, can I take over on the hypothesis in the play part? What is your opinion in that? Oh, very good. You know, this is, mind you, this is the real starting point, you know, Kians and others. You know, they, you see, this is really the very starting and very novel ideas, okay? That they really thought that they might have, you know, acted as a sort of gene or scaffold of gene. Beautiful. But, this is the sort of starting point by which the recent, what I said, this is the idea evolved, you know, that there are actually two minutes, not only one play, but both play and pilot, they play a very, very important role. Okay? You have seen the scaffold, you know, you need some kind of outer structure, and then you take the structure in space. Many of the buildings are really done by, whenever you see this arch, dome, this is how they do it, you know. They make a sort of scaffold, put the concrete and stone, then they take out the scaffold. So these minerals, you know, they have this intricate structure. So why don't you tell that that is a three particle yeah. the yeah. so They are combined together. So that may be uh, that possibly happen in the play you know, module or No, you see, the two things have been different properties. People have done experiments. They have found that play has the affinity for, you know nucleic acids, whereas the pilot has the affinity for amino acids. Yeah. People have done lots of experiments about all these things. So, you know, whatever I said, this is not my, you know, whole world. There are many people who have spent their whole life. I just put it together. I just saw, it, it just saw in a, you know, we have some children in there. Yeah. I just take a little glass and walk in a and take some part of the food there. So, I saw, there is one article, 16th March 2015. Yeah. Uh, Because 
uh, there was no UV light and nothing so positive. The first light came to the studio and in the, on the surface of the sea water there was uh, scorching and light and pollution which had destroyed the light. So that is one thing. But these people, they say, one scientist has a problem with some god or some name. He supported this theory and they say that in the previous earth, when the molecules were working, that is the inaugural molecules, they were working and most of their those organic chemicals possibly they have destroyed the formation of my child or something. And if the part, uh, this scientist that is part, Professor Bart, he said those nitrides possibly again destroyed by some of the other molecules um, and uh, possibly that is not true that the nitride, all the organic molecules have destroyed. Some possibly were there and they then form the organic molecule very many of the other ribose right? and many others and the lipid acid and the wall population etc. So which theory is now that is should we prefer the I told the student that the hydrocarbon but what I saw the article then they had eighteen but you see it when NASA, you know, the first part was really NASA's work. Yeah. That is, you know, all these things are presented, you know, called exobiotic, presented, you know, asteroid. Not only the interstellar particles, you know, these ice, ice particles, they have identified all the ingredients of that. And there, you see, the reason for 50 years, when we followed the Miller's experiment, they could produce it, it was a wrong man, blind animal. Yeah. So they tried. But then when they found that it is already there, start with these things, you know. And we know that our planet was heavily bombarded. Even today, if we just take one meteorite, like Murchison, 60s, they were able to identify everything, all the ingredients you need, the building blocks of life there. Whereas for 50 years, scientists, they tried to find, well, do it, nothing. They could have produced any body maybe other than protein, you know, because amino acid is easy. Yes. Early uh, Earth, it contained uh, more energetic molecules like methane and ammonia. The later of carbon dioxide and others, they, their, their carbon has already lost some some its energy. So that's one thing. It just needed some uh, ca catalytic surface or whatever. The other thing is, it is also possible that the origin of life in meteorites and in Earth could have the same origin. Because even in outer space, you need uh, some energy, like electric sparks, uh, burst of uh, whatever, I mean, showers or something, which was already present in the atmosphere in early Earth, lightning, uh, for example. <laughs> no. The problem was, you know, I think you really asked a very elevated question. The reason it could not form, again, there are many scientists ask the same question. Why, you know, we find it a meteorite, but we do not find, people try, we do not find all these building blocks of life. Otherwise, it would be easier. The main, the only reason is to produce all these things. You need to enter a different environment which was never present in our planet. That means you need a sort of freezing cold. Okay? Mind you, all this interstellar space, if you go there, I mean, look at it. It's an ice, nothing else. And that kind of temperature was not, instead, our planet was hot. You see, it was not that. So it was there, it came almost straight away. Because that condition never reached in the early earth. Yes, later in our planet was really frozen, at least two to three times. Why did the light proliferate? But. Yeah, but you still need a theory. Yeah. Here. Yeah. No, mind you, not bigger molecules. Bigger molecules are produced here. It is only the monomer which came from. So here what happens, whatever you are suggesting, I mean these people have done lots of experiments with bait. The bait is really like a cooker. And they are producing methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide, sulfur, and the space molecules are coming, you know. So it's really because both two things, they are mixing and matching together. Okay? So some, yes, produced in our planet, 
some came from outer space. But these are complex monomers, still so difficult to produce here. So the only thing scientists came out that, you know, probably that condition never reached on the planet. Because you see, our planet was entirely in a different direction going on to the initial stage. It has hot, molten, it's almost like a sort of, you know, globe of molten lava. Whereas you need this crazy, you know, look at the Saturn ring, it's just ice. Uh, so the amino acids in meteorites uh, are found to be non, I'm resin, non chiral hmm? So the amino acids yeah. in that matches and meteorite yeah. have been found to be non chiral resin. So how is the chirality origin? Mm -hmm. Say, so I can put it. The amino acids yeah. in Murchison's material yeah. found to be racemic. That is not chiral. Non? Not chiral. Oh, so how did chiral. the chirality origin? Chirality, this is again Mother Earth did this. Mm -hmm. Just you need calcium crystal. So you see, these are all dumped here. This is why, you know, it's sort of complementary. You bring some you know, ingredients from a store, then you see how the cook does it. Okay, I don't need it. I didn't, you know. So you see the chirality, the selection really took place in our planet. For example, you know, people have done it and all the time. Pharmaceutical company they separate. Okay, so there are certain catalysts which are very common in a sort of vent environment, like calcite and others. So mind you, chirality was not there. You are so right. But in fact, they found 70 amino acids which are not present in life. We only use 20. But sir, the, the temperature was, I mean, considerably high. So this selects and... No, but the meteorites, when... No, not the meteorite. Oh. I mean... Here, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So how could this selection be made at such a high temperature? That's a very good question. That's why I really, you see, this vent, the actual submarine vent is 400 degrees centigrade. Yeah. And many people thought it's not the ideal, you know, it will break down. But if you see the terrestrial thermal field, like hot spring and this heater, these are only 60 degrees, which is just, just optimum, very good. And that's, you know, there's a huge temperature range. And that's, not only that, I didn't mention, if you look at the, all the iron contents of our body, any living thing, it doesn't match with oceanic water, but it matches perfectly with a set of, you know, hot spring or crater lake, which are terrestrial. So that's where many people think, you know, wherever life might have been formed, not in this open ocean, but instead of very small, you know, ponds. Crater has one of the interesting things, it has a huge wall. You know, you can visualize a large crater, maybe two, three miles tall wall. Now, why you need this one? Because you don't want mixing and matching. You, you know, like a, just like a pot. That gives, you know, why you can concentrate the material. So, you know, Twitter has lots of advantages which can, you know, which can, you know, answer some of the criticism people have, you know, put against uh, ocean yeah. yeah, I'll be here. Maybe, you know, one to one, I think we can go out there. Oh, go ahead. No, yes. Sure. Uh, so you were this talking, is the last question. So you were talking about lean modulus and yes. uh, actually, uh, Also, uh, but uh, I wish the students had asked about this, but they didn't. Uh, I just wanted to know that uh, when we read about uh, Lynn Margulis, we start off uh, from where uh, the cells have already been formed. Like, uh, you can, you can yeah, do it. Since uh, you say that you're very close to her and very uh, friend, uh, you were a friend of hers, I would uh, really want to know whether uh, she had any ideas about life before that. So she, I mean, I mean we don't get to uh, see anything about that in her works. No, she didn't really, but when I sent my manuscript, she actually came to love her. She, you know, she was so excited, she said, you know, I always thought that the symbiosis should be at the molecular level. But we showed it and she was very excited. But uh, she, you know, in a popular article she talked about the origin of life. But her greatest work is really this. Or you know, you can say, and I think it is, you know, it is a really good well question. I understand all of you like to interact for, uh, for this strategy, but we have to make the program uh, sh shorter now. 
and because uh, the lecture is so uh, exciting and scintillating and he explained uh, uh, the complexity of life so lucidly. So now the last ritual that is for vote of thanks, I request our Honorable uh, Dean of Science to come this question. And I'll leave this slide with you so you can use it for teaching or whatever you want. I feel honored and a little bit vibrant uh, to extend our vote of thanks uh, uh, to Professor Chatterjee. Actually, uh, this is an outstanding lecture, wonderful lecture, that we have exposed uh, some complex uh, phenomenon. Actually, uh, origin of life is very, very complex, and he has already uh, elucidated us a very simple theory for the origin of life before us. Uh, so, I, we, on behalf of university, we thank you profusely, sir. We are grateful to you for coming uh, to our university, and uh, definitely. Uh, we are grateful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor because it's an academic renaissance. Actually, uh, under his guidance uh, and under his uh, leadership, university has conducted a series of distinguished lectures, and actually, his, uh, our, uh, a series of distinguished lectures has been originated, initiated uh, from its head. Uh, we deeply gratitude to him, sir. And we definitely thank all the faculty members, all the research scholars, all the students, and definitely the Department of the Botany, one of the best departments of our university for organizing this uh, distinguished lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>